The Desire of Ages Chapter 35 Peace Be Still This chapter is based on Matthew 8, Mark 4, Mark 5, and Luke 8. It had been an eventful day in the life of Jesus. Beside the Sea of Galilee, he had spoken his first parables by familiar illustrations, again explaining to the people the nature of his kingdom and the manner in which it was to be established. He had likened his own work to that of the sower, the development of his kingdom to the growth of the mustard seed and the effect of leaven in the measure of meal. The great final separation of the righteous and the wicked he had pictured in the parable of the wheat and tears and the fishing net. The exceeding preciousness of the truths he taught had been illustrated by the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, while in the parable of the householder he taught his disciples how they were to labor as his representatives. All day he had been teaching and healing, and as evening came on, the crowds still pressed upon him. Day after day he administered to them, scarcely pausing for food or rest. The malicious criticism and misrepresentation with which the Pharisees constantly pursued him made his labors much more severe and harassing. And now the close of day found him so utterly wearied that he determined to seek retirement in some solitary place across the lake. The eastern shore of Genezareth was not uninhabited, for there were towns here and there beside the lake, yet it was a desolate region when compared with the western side. It contained a population more heathen than Jewish and had little communication with Galilee. Thus, it offered Jesus the seclusion he sought, and he now bade his disciples accompany him thither. After he had dismissed the multitude, they took him even as he was into the boat and hastily set off. But they were not to depart alone. There were other fishing boats lying near the shore, and these were quickly crowded with people who followed Jesus, still eager to see and hear him. The Savior was at last relieved from the pressure of the multitude, and overcome with weariness and hunger, he lay down in the stern of the boat and soon fell asleep. The evening had been calm and pleasant, and quiet rested upon the lake, but suddenly darkness overspread the sky. The wind swept wildly down the mountain gorges along the eastern shore, and a fierce tempest burst upon the lake. The sun had set, and the blackness of night settled down upon the stormy sea. The waves, lashed into fury by the howling winds, dashed fiercely over the disciples' boat and threatened to engulf it. Those hardy fishermen had spent their lives upon the lake and had guided their craft safely through many a storm. But now their strength and skill availed nothing. They were helpless in the grasp of the tempest and hope failed them as they saw that their boat was filling. Absorbed in their efforts to save themselves, they had forgotten that Jesus was on board. Now, seeing their labor in vain and only death before them, they remembered at whose command they had set out to cross the sea. In Jesus was their only hope. In their helplessness and despair, they cried, Master! Master! But the dense darkness hid him from their sight. Their voices were drowned by the roaring of the tempest, and there was no reply. Doubt and fear assailed them. Had Jesus forsaken them? Was he who had conquered disease and demons and even death powerless to help his disciples now? Was he unmindful of them in their distress? Again they call, but there is no answer except the shrieking of the angry blast. Already their boat is sinking. A moment, and apparently they'll be swallowed up by the hungry waters. Suddenly, 
A flash of lightning pierces the darkness, and they see Jesus lying asleep, undisturbed by the tumult. In amazement and despair, they exclaim, Master, carest thou not that we perish? How can he rest so peacefully while they are in danger and battling with death? Their cry arouses Jesus. As the lightning's glare reveals him, they see the peace of heaven in his face. They read in his glance self-forgetful, tender love, and their hearts, turning to him, cry, Lord, save us, we perish. Never did a soul utter that cry unheeded. As the disciples grasp their oars to make a last effort, Jesus rises. He stands in the midst of his disciples while the tempest rages. The waves break over them and the lightning illuminates his countenance. He lifts his hand, so often employed in deeds of mercy, and says to the angry sea, Peace, be still. The storm ceases. The billows sink to rest. The clouds roll away and the stars shine forth. The boat rests upon a quiet sea. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus asks sorrowfully, Why are ye fearful? Have ye not faith? Mark 4 and verse 40. A hush fell upon the disciples. Even Peter did not attempt to express the awe that filled his heart. The boats that had set out to accompany Jesus had been in the same peril with that of the disciples. Terror and despair had seized their occupants, but the command of Jesus brought quiet to the scene of tumult. The fury of the storm had driven the boats into close proximity, and all on board beheld the miracle. In the calm that followed, fear was forgotten. The people whispered among themselves, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. And he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. John 5 and verse 30. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care, that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. As Jesus rested by faith in the Father's care, so are we to rest in the care of our Savior. If the disciples had trusted in him, they would have been kept in peace. Their fear in the time of danger revealed their unbelief. In their efforts to save themselves, they forgot Jesus. And it was only when, in despair of self-dependence, they turned to him that he could give them help. How often the disciples' experience is ours. When the tempests of temptation gather, and the fierce lightnings flash, and the waves sweep over us, we battle with the storm alone, forgetting that there is one who can help us. We trust to our own strength till our hope is lost and we are ready to perish. Then we remember Jesus. And if we call upon him to save us, we shall not cry in vain. Though he sorrowfully reproves our unbelief and self-confidence, he never fails to give us the help we need. Whether on the land or on the sea, if we have the Savior in our hearts, there is no need of fear. Living faith in the Redeemer will smooth the sea of life and will deliver us from danger in the way that he knows to be best. There is another spiritual lesson in this miracle of the stilling of the tempest. 
Every man's experience testifies to the truth of the words of Scripture. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57 verses 20 and 21 Sin has destroyed our peace. While self is unsubdued, we can find no rest. The masterful passions of the heart no human power can control. We are as helpless here as were the disciples to quiet the raging storm. But he who spoke peace to the billows of Galilee has spoken the word of peace for every soul. However fierce the tempest, those who turn to Jesus with the cry, Lord, save us, will find deliverance. His grace that reconciles the soul to God quiets the strife of human passion, and in his love the heart is at rest. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Psalm 107, verses 29 and 30. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Romans 5, verse 1, Isaiah 32, verse 17. In the early morning, the Savior and his companions came to shore, and the light of the rising sun touched sea and land as with the benediction of peace. But no sooner had they stepped upon the beach than their eyes were greeted by a sight more terrible than the fury of the tempest. From some hiding place among the tombs, Two madmen rushed upon them as if to tear them in pieces. Hanging about these men were parts of chains which they had broken in escaping from confinement. Their flesh was torn and bleeding where they had cut themselves with sharp stones. Their eyes glared out from their long and matted hair. The very likeness of humanity seemed to have been blotted out by the demons that possessed them, and they looked more like wild beasts than men. The disciples and their companions fled in terror, but presently they noticed that Jesus was not with them, and they turned to look for him. He was standing where they had left him. He who had stilled the tempest, who had before met Satan and conquered him, did not flee before these demons. When the men, gnashing their teeth and foaming at the mouth, approached him, Jesus raised that hand which had beckoned the waves to rest, and the men could come no nearer. They stood raging but helpless before him. With authority he bade the unclean spirits come out of them. His words penetrated the darkened minds of the unfortunate men. They realized dimly that one was near who could save them from the tormenting demons. They fell at the Saviour's feet to worship him, but when their lips were opened to entreat his mercy, the demons spoke through them, crying vehemently, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God Most High? I beseech thee, torment me not. Jesus asked, What is thy name? And the answer was, My name is Legion, for we are many. Using the afflicted men, as mediums of communication, they besought Jesus not to send them out of the country. Upon a mountainside not far distant, a great herd of swine was feeding. Into these the demons asked to be allowed to enter, and Jesus suffered them. Immediately a panic seized the herd. They rushed madly down the cliff, and unable to check themselves upon the shore, plunged into the lake and perished. Meanwhile, a marvelous change had come over the demoniacs. Light had shone into their minds. Their eyes beamed with intelligence. The countenances so long deformed into the image of Satan became suddenly mild, and the blood-stained hands were quiet. And with glad voices, the men praised God for their deliverance. From the cliff, 
the keepers of the swine had seen all that had occurred, and they hurried away to publish the news to their employers and to all the people. In fear and amazement, the whole population flocked to meet Jesus. The two demoniacs had been the terror of the country. No one had been safe to pass the place where they were, for they would rush upon every traveler with the fury of demons. Now these men were clothed and in their right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words and glorifying the name of him who had made them whole. But the people who beheld this wonderful scene did not rejoice. The loss of the swine seemed to them of greater moment than the deliverance of these captives of Satan. It was in mercy to the owners of the swine that this loss had been permitted to come upon them. They were absorbed in earthly things and cared not for the great interests of spiritual life. Jesus desired to break the spell of selfish indifference that they might accept his grace, but regret and indignation for their temporal loss blinded their eyes to the Savior's mercy. The manifestation of supernatural power aroused the superstitions of the people and excited their fears. Further calamities might follow from having this stranger among them. They apprehended financial ruin and determined to be freed from his presence. Those who had crossed the lake with Jesus told of all that had happened on the preceding night of their path in the tempest and how the wind and sea had been stilled, but their words were without effect. In terror, the people thronged about Jesus, beseeching him to depart from them, and he complied, taking ship at once for the opposite shore. The people of Gergesa had before them the living evidence of Christ's power and mercy. They saw the men who had been restored to reason, but they were so fearful of endangering their earthly interests that he who had vanquished the prince of darkness before their eyes was treated as an intruder, and the gift of heaven was turned from their doors. We have not the opportunity of turning from the presence of Christ as had the Gergensees, but still there are many who refuse to obey his word, because obedience would involve the sacrifice of some worldly interest. Lest his presence shall cause them pecuniary loss, many reject his grace and drive his spirit from them. But far different was the feeling of the restored demoniacs. They desired the company of their deliverer. In his presence, they felt secure from the demons that had tormented their lives and wasted their manhood. As Jesus was about to enter the boat, they kept close to his side, knelt at his feet, and begged him to keep them near him where they might ever listen to his words. But Jesus made them go home and tell what great things the Lord had done for them. Here was a work for them to do, to go to a heathen home and tell of the blessing they had received from Jesus. It was hard for them to be separated from the Savior. Great difficulties were sure to beset them in association with their heathen countrymen, and their long isolation from society seemed to have disqualified them for the work he had indicated. But as soon as Jesus pointed out their duty, they were ready to obey. Not only did they tell their own households and neighbors about Jesus, but they went throughout Decapolis, everywhere declaring his power to save and describing how he had freed them from the demons. In doing this work, they could receive a greater blessing than if merely for benefit to themselves they had remained in his presence. It is in working to spread the good news of salvation that we are brought near to the Savior. The two restored demoniacs were the first missionaries whom Christ sent to preach the gospel in the region of Decapolis. For a few moments only, these men had been privileged to hear the teachings of Christ. Not one sermon from his lips had ever fallen upon their ears. They could not instruct the people as the disciples who had been daily with Christ were able to do. But they bore in their own persons the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. They could tell what they knew 
what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. This is what everyone can do whose heart has been touched by the grace of God. John, the beloved disciple, wrote, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. 1 John 1, verses 1 through 3. As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know, what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. If we have been following Jesus step by step, we shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. We can tell how we have tested his promise and found the promise true. We can be a witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ. This is the witness for which our Lord calls and for want of which the world is perishing. Though the people of Gergesa had not received Jesus, he did not leave them to the darkness they had chosen. When they bade him depart from them, they had not heard his words. They were ignorant of that which they were rejecting. Therefore he again sent the light to them, and by those to whom they would not refuse to listen. In causing the destruction of the swine, it was Satan's purpose to turn the people away from the Savior and prevent the preaching of the gospel in that region. But this very occurrence roused the whole country as nothing else could have done and directed attention to Christ. Though the Savior himself departed, the men whom he had healed remained as witnesses to his power. Those who had been mediums of the Prince of Darkness became channels of light, messengers of the Son of God. Men marveled as they listened to the wondrous news. A door was opened to the gospel throughout that region. When Jesus returned to Decapolis, the people flocked about him, and for three days, not merely the inhabitants of one town, but thousands from all around the region heard the message of salvation. Even the power of demons is under the control of our Savior, and the working of evil is overruled for good. The encounter with the demoniacs of Gergesa had a lesson for the disciples. It showed the depths of degradation to which Satan is seeking to drag the whole human race, and the mission of Christ to set men free from his power. Those wretched beings, dwelling in the place of graves, possessed by demons, in bondage to uncontrolled passions and loathsome lusts, represent what humanity would become if given up to satanic jurisdiction. Satan's influence is constantly exerted upon men to distract the senses, control the mind for evil, and incite to violence and crime. He weakens the body, darkens the intellect, and debases the soul. Whenever men reject the Savior's invitation, they are yielding themselves to Satan. Multitudes in every department of life, in the home, in business, and even in the church, are doing this today. It is because of this that violence and crime have overspread the earth, and moral darkness like the pall of death enshrouds the habitations of men. Through his specious temptations, Satan leads men to worse and worse evils, till utter depravity and ruin are the result. The only safeguard against his power is found in the presence of Jesus. Before men and angels, Satan has been revealed as man's enemy and destroyer, Christ as man's friend and deliverer. His spirit will develop in man all that will ennoble the character and dignify the nature. It will build man up for the glory of God in body and soul and spirit. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 He has called us to the obtaining of the glory, the character, 
of our Lord Jesus Christ has called us to be conformed to the image of his Son. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Romans 8 and verse 29. And souls that have been degraded into instruments of Satan are still, through the power of Christ, transformed into messengers of righteousness and sent forth by the Son of God to tell what great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. The End of Chapter 35 Of the Desire of Ages